Um, it's my pleasure to introduce the, the main speaker for this uh, session, and that'll be John, John Shannon. John uh, began working for NASA in 1988, uh, shortly after graduating from college with a degree in aerospace engineering. He worked as a guidance navigation and flight control officer in the mission control in Houston, where he served uh, for 23 space shuttle flights. In 1993, at the age of 28, John was selected as a flight director, the youngest ever. He served as flight until 2003, when he was assigned to assist with the Columbia Accident Investigation Board for their work. From November 2008 until very, very recently, as you might have heard, uh, John was uh, the Space uh, Shuttle Program Manager, personally responsible for all aspects of launch, operation, and landing for the Space Shuttle. Since the landing of STS-135, the final flight of the Space Shuttle systems, John has been tasked with evaluating NASA's future exploration plans to ensure the agency builds and builds the correct space architecture for the future. So, so John is carrying his work from the past into the future. And, and uh, John is a close friend. I can, I can say he's my friend and uh, comrade, and I think he'll give you a great perspective of the shuttle program. But more importantly, I think he'll even uh, kind of lead and show you a little bit how we can bridge off of what the shuttle into the new future programs are. So without any further ado, here's John. Okay, thank you very much. And I brought the most important man in the room right here. We're going to start off with a, a short video. It's about four minutes, and it, um, it's the highlights of the next to last uh, space shuttle mission that we flew.
Okay, uh, for those of you that uh, are not uh, really familiar with the space shuttle program, let me just give you a quick overview. I'm going to talk about the program structure for a very short period of time, uh, a little bit about the program accomplishments. We're not going to spend a lot of time there, but what I really want to focus on today is I picked out four different areas in the, uh, in the space shuttle program that had varying levels of success over our 30-year history. And I want to compare and contrast those a little bit to tell you why, uh, why I think that we had different levels of success in those areas. Uh, the Space Shuttle program is Marshall Space Flight Center did all the propulsion elements, the external tank, the boosters, the main engines. We did all of our propulsive testing at the Stena Space Center. Johnson Space Center was responsible for the orbiter itself, the uh, crew training, the mission control center, and of course at Kennedy Space Center is where we ended up integrating and flying all of the vehicles. Um, as most of you know, 135 missions in 30 years, 98.5% success rate. Ascent was 99.25%. Uh, we flew 350 astronauts in over 800 slots. And important, I think, to, uh, to the space community was it was the first opportunity that we had to fly women astronauts, minority astronauts, people from other countries, people that did not have the opportunity to fly earlier in the Apollo program. Uh, they had an opportunity in the space program, in the shuttle program, and I think it opened up uh, space in the in the minds of uh, of youth that they could actually go do that. Uh, we also had a lot of opportunities for students to get involved in shuttle programs through things like getaway specials. Of course, the planetary mission achievements we know: Magellan went to uh, to Venus, uh, Ulysses studied the sun, Galileo went to Jupiter. They were all deployed from the space shuttle. Uh, we deployed three of the uh, great observatories, Hubble, along with the servicing missions, the Compton Gamma Ray Observatory, Chandra X-ray Observatory. Uh, it really changed our view of, uh, of the universe. Human spaceflight achievement with the, uh, the International Space Station. We did dockings. We went to the, uh, the Mir 11 times, I believe. Uh, we built ISS with, the, uh, with our partner countries. The shuttle took up the uh, components from the United States, Canada, uh, Europe and Japan. I always love the uh, how busy it looks inside the lab itself. Um, a lot of other things that the shuttle did. I, I'm not going to go into them in great detail today. Earth OBS missions. Uh, we mapped the entire globe with uh, with radar. We did defense missions early in the program. We did a lot of materials processing. Deployed 181 satellites. Uh, did life sciences experiments with Space Lab, Space Hab. Uh, those were the, uh, the uh, precursors for the uh, International Space Station. Uh, we used the protocols we developed there. Now, let me talk about what are the lessons that we can learn from 30 years of operations. And the first one that I would tell you that, that we should learn is that complexity increases over time. And as Gerst said, in my new job, I'm looking at uh, design reference missions and proposals from all kinds of folks. I tell you one thing, NASA has a lot of design reference missions and a lot of people that are out there thinking about what the next thing is. And they come into my office and they show me very simplistic pictures that look very easy to go do. And, uh, and I, I try to, to spin that back into my experience with the space shuttle program and that nothing is simple. As you learn more about it, as you try to do more things, your requirements increase. And as those requirements increase, your complexity increases. Now, this was the, um, I guess this was PowerPoint of the day back in the 70s, right? The, uh, the little hand drawing. But this was the orbiter. It's just rolled into the, uh, into the uh, orbiter processing facility. You can see some nice guys in white coats that are doing something, maybe fueling it up or putting a new payload in it. And I'm sure sh it's going to shortly go out to the, uh, to the launch pad to be launched every, every week and a half or two weeks. Uh, that was the initial concept, and of course, I'm seeing a lot of that today in some of the new proposals. This is reality. Uh, that is the orbiter processing facility. There is a vehicle in there uh, underneath all that scaffolding, and that is what was required to, uh, to be able to do the turnaround of the vehicle and to, to meet all of the, uh, the constraints that we had to make sure that the vehicle was ready to go fly. Now, you know, if you think about the shuttle program, what did it take to do the shuttle program? Well, you had solid rocket booster production, transportation. We had our own uh, train system that, uh, in the shuttle program that brought, uh, brought the uh, boosters from where it was received over to the VAB. Uh, we did integration and stacking. For orbiter processing in that OPF, of course, we would uh, work on the vehicle uh, an extensive amount of time between flights, uh, install main engines, haul it over to the VAB. For external tanks, we would build them over in Louisiana at the Michoud plant, barge them over through the intercoastal waterway, get it to the VAB. You'd do vehicle integration, stack the boosters, put on an ET, 
lift an orbiter, and finally be ready to go out to a pad. After you launched, then you would go get those boosters. You'd send divers down, recover them, bring them back by ship, and refurbish them. Orbiter recovery, of course, you could land in California or Florida. If it was California, you'd bring it back on the 747. Uh, then you'd, you'd haul the vehicle back. Now, that didn't have anything to do with payloads. It didn't have anything to do with crew training. It didn't have anything to do with control centers. Uh, it didn't have anything to do with flight software. All the other little things that are out there, the program was immensely complex. And uh, every morning when I would wake up, the BlackBerry would be full, and it would be, it would be the problems of the day. And uh, so I can't, they gave me an hour. I can't go over what are all the lessons that we learned from the space shuttle. Um, but it is very true that 30 years is significant. That is a good arc of time to look at different ways that we handle different systems and then look at things that were successful for us and things that weren't and understand why. And I think that is immensely important as we move forward into our next, uh, next programs. So I picked four different areas uh, where we had different approaches uh, to compare. Now the first one, actually the first three, if anyone would ask uh, Bob Thompson, who was the first program manager, what are your three biggest things that keep you awake at night uh, in the 70s in the development of the shuttle? And I think he would have answered the digital flight control system, our fly-by-wire system, and the flight software that supports it. The space shuttle main engine, because it was a very high technical bar to build that engine to make it reliable. The thermal protection system, the tiles, the reinforced carbon-carbon, the blankets. I threw another one in here, external tank, because it, it uh, describes another issue that, uh, that I saw as program manager. So we're going to go through all, all four of these and, and talk about why some were successful and some were not. Uh, the first will be the uh, digital flight control system. And of course, this is the, the flight software system. Yeah, this is one of my favorite sayings, and it is so true, right? Software ages like wine. It gets better over time. Hardware ages like milk, right? As you use it, as you wear it out, as it goes through uh, repetitive uh, uh, uses, it needs to be changed out occasionally, right? And I hope you change your milk out occasionally. Um, software is not like that. Once you have software, you can continually test it, continually improve it, and get better and better and better on it. The, uh, the shuttle system with the software and the, the computers, it is a very complicated system. There are four computers that are controlling the vehicle. Uh, during all of its critical phases. There's a backup computer that uh, runs completely independent software. And uh, each one of those primary computers controls all the things you would expect. It's got the, uh, the memory system for it. It's got all the sensors like inertial measurement units and rate gyro systems. Uh, it's got all the effectors like uh, uh, the actuators for elevons and reaction control system jets and, and gimbals for engines, uh, displays and keyboards so the crews can talk to it. Uh, a lot of uplink and downlink uh, hardware and software so that the ground can command it or you can bring telemetry down. Uh, you've got all the system software, all the things to do robotics and keep your, your life support system uh, okay. Uh, all of those different things uh, that you need to run the spacecraft, you're running in that software. And every flight, we had new software for new payloads. And uh, so every flight, you're, you're changing some of that software to, to be able to command and understand how your payloads are doing. This uh, system ran very quickly, especially for the time. Uh, it would do error detection within 0.12 seconds, which was, uh, which was really good. Now, software, and I'm going to talk about for each of the four, the software that we had, we had a very strong test culture in the software. It was very, very strong. The simulators that the crews would get into and run their procedures and work with the control center, they used the real computers and the real software. If there were any issues with it at all, if, if the flight controller saw something that was a little strange, crew saw something a little strange, training team, we would stop the simulation. We would go take all the memory out of the computers, dump it to a file, and then let the computer experts go and look at it. Very strong culture to document any discrepancies. Most of them came back and said, yeah, that's just the way it works. A lot of them came back and said, this was a surprise to us. We need to go fix it. Um, we had dedicated shuttle avionics labs. We had dedicated uh, shuttle propulsion labs where we checked out all of that software. We also did periodic releases of new software, and you'll hear this as a theme, that we did not just sit there and let the software be from STS-1 and not change it. It was periodically upgraded. As we found issues, if we saw we could make improvements, we would do that. The benefit of that is that we kept a very sharp team that understood how the software worked, how to fix it, how to test it. So we had those periodic releases. So we were in this process of continually evolving and continually enhancing the flight software and making it better and better. 
And you can see that in this, uh, in this chart here. What you have is the entire length of the program on the, uh, on the horizontal scale, and this is the number of problems. And this black line was the initial number of problems, and as they were solved, it would go down. And you can see in the last few years of the program, we were not working any significant software issues whatsoever. The dashed lines, these were problems that were either introduced or that were found, and they're doing exactly what you want to have happen, is they're going asymptotically to zero rate. They're not getting bigger. And that was, uh, this was why the flight software was such a success. We had a, uh, let me go to, to one issue, because if you're thinking, hey, it's just software, right? So you get the blue screen of death, and, and, and that's no big deal, and you can go to the backup system if you really had to. That's really not true. Um, on 41D, which was before the Challenger mission, uh, there was a delay. We had an engine problem on the pad. We had to roll the vehicle back and, uh, and go swap engines out. And during that two-month time period, well, the software team was working on a load that was coming up in the future. It's one of those periodic upgrades. And uh, they determined that there was a slight problem. It was a little bit out of spec in that the, uh, the external tank separation uh, pyrotechnics, uh, the command had to be issued within a certain window. And uh, there was a potential that you could miss a cycle and uh, infrequently that it could be 40, sec 40 milliseconds late. And the software guys didn't know if that was a big deal or not. They went to the hardware guys. Hardware guys said, it's going to be fine. It'll, it'll be okay. Then they thought about it a little more, and they said, why don't we go test it? So they went over and they tested it, and the pyros didn't fire. Um, so if we'd have gotten into this case, we'd have had the ET on the orbiter uh, after engine shutoff. The pass system would have sh disabled the system. Engaging the backup would not have allowed you to, uh, to uh, be able to separate because the system was disabled and you'd been stuck. So uh, quickly made a fix to that and then were able to launch roughly on time. Now, software is important, just like every other system on a, on a space vehicle is important. Uh, why was software successful? Constant testing. We tested, tested, tested. Every single day that we ran a sim, every single day we did things to go and stress that software where you would fail systems, see how the software reacted in a simulator itself with the crew really pushing buttons. And then if you saw something, you had that culture that you would go and, and you would bring it up. So there was rigorous verification. In flight, if there were any issues at all, we had a team there that was able to, to, uh, to diagnose it right away. And we continually evolved the system to maintain critical skills and constantly improve. This was a success. Flight software on the shuttle was an absolute success, and it's because of those two things, test culture and continually improving it. Okay, let's go to, uh, to a totally different system, right? We went software. Let's talk propulsion now. And uh, the space shuttle main engine. Now, the main engine on the shuttle is an incredibly uh, advanced technological achievement. Liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen, uh, 500,000 pounds of thrust, only weighs 7,748 pounds. It's the first throttleable, completely reusable space engine. Um, I wanted to talk a few minutes. This is your fun facts about space shuttle main engines, okay? You can go home and wow your kids about these, right? But I wanted to do this because you need to understand how high the bar was set on trying to make space shuttle main engines as high a performance as they were. Uh, it's the first reusable liquid rocket engine, temperature extremes, liquid hydrogen is minus 423. The combustion chamber is 6,000 degrees Fahrenheit past the boiling point of iron. Uh, when three of them are running, you, you've got 37 million horsepower going. I like this one. Uh, if you like to work on your car, you need to get a fuel turbo pump from the shuttle uh, excess because the fuel turbo pump would generate 70,000 horsepower or 70 horsepower for every pound, and your car generates about a half a horsepower for every single pound. The avionics for the main engine were very impressive. Closed loop control on chamber pressure mixture ratio. The engine could adjust itself to, uh, to keep up its, uh, its thrust level. Uh, it had dual redundant controllers. It had health management. Uh, is throttleable. We got a million seconds of test time on space shuttle main engines, either out at Stennis or in flight itself. Burned up 300 million gallons of propellant. That was a very good expenditure of propellant uh, because we operated safely on all 135 shuttle flights. We had one shutdown due to a sensor issue. Uh, the mission was completed uh, with 100% success. All right, so why was the shuttle uh, main engine program 
successful, rigorous testing throughout the life of the program. And the testing was not, we're just going to run it exactly like we expect to run it. We would run corner of the box testing, different mixture ratios, different head pressures, different throttle settings. We were constantly trying to find out how far we could stretch an SSME uh, before it would have a problem. In the flight program, we had excellent instrumentation coming down from the vehicle. We had post-flight teardown and analysis where we could go and open ports up and do inspections of different pieces of the engine to see if you had any kind of issues at all. And the same thing I said in software applies here. We had skills retention where there was continuous evolution on the engine. We kept on trying to make it better through block upgrades and improving the engines. Now, oh, here we go. We'll see if this one works. This is why we were successful, folks, on main engines. If it, whoops. That was one of our tests at Stennis. Now, you can look at this. Most of our runtime was in those tests. This is similar to software. This is the history of the SSME development. All it actually started in '75, so we had about 36 years on this. This is the accumulated time in seconds. It's this this value here. Accumulated time in seconds that we ran the engines. Red triangles. That's really bad. That's an uncontained shutdown. Something came apart in the engine. Yellow means that you had a significant failure where the engine shut down, but maybe it didn't come apart. And the uh, circles, those are significant issues you had that could have led to an engine shutdown, but just did not. Thank goodness we did not have the internet and blogs in the early beginning of, <laughs> we, we would have killed it, right? I mean, it was, the technology was that difficult. It was, it was that hard to do. Um, these were very difficult times trying to get the engine just to start and run correctly. Um, but what you can see is this was the early development. These are high power testings. And then we did these block upgrades where we improved the engine. We, we had a bigger main uh, combustion chamber throat. Uh, we did a lot of things with the turbo pumps. And we got better as we went, as we had more and more time. And you can see this was Columbia. Post-Columbia, we didn't have any issues at all in our test or flight program. Uh, and, and it just got better and better as we went along. And that's what you wanted to do, is, is you want to have the test, you want to get all that infant mortality out, you want to do the improvements, have that evolution, and get better and better. This uh, chart is uh, post-Challenger, is where it started, and it shows how we did on the pad with main engines. Uh, a D is an on-pad delay, an S is a scrub for an engine issue, an A is actually where you started the engines up, but then you, you aborted on the pad where you had to shut them down, which is a very exciting day, by the way. Um, but we got exactly what we wanted, right? As we did the block upgrades, we got better and better as we went along. Um, and it's, uh, it, that just demonstrates how the shuttle main engine uh, just improved. Now, lessons learned. This is going to sound very familiar to you, right? Is we tested to the boundaries of capability. We tested as much as we possibly could. Uh, we didn't just do nominal tests. We tested in, in different corners of the performance box. We did extensive uh, verification of the flight performance. In other words, we would look at high rate data coming down from the engines. We would go inspect the engines post-flight, and we continually evolved the engine to make it better and better as we would find an issue with it. As a matter of fact, um, I funded and, and bought uh, engine 2062, uh, which was delivered about a year and a half before the program ended. We knew it would not make it into the fleet. We knew we would not fly that, vehicle, that uh, engine on a vehicle. But I needed those people to stay. I needed them to have sharp skills because you couldn't predict if you would have some kind of an issue in testing or in flight that you would need those people back. So it was a good investment for us. And I hope now that we'll actually be able to use that engine on a flying vehicle and, and, uh, and take advantage of it. But it's the same lesson. So we had two different things, software and a propulsion system. Same lesson to be learned out of it is you test like crazy and you continually improve. You don't stop. You're never done. Okay, let's talk about the, uh, the thermal protection system. And I'll give you a little bit of background here on it, right? When we were designing the space shuttle, our only uh, history in the design of a heat shield was from Apollo. And Apollo was 
um, they did not understand the, uh, the heating effects of a lunar return trajectory, right? So what they did is they, they took uh, two things. One, whenever you talk about heat shields, you've got to talk about heat rate, which is how hot it gets really quick. So you've got a spike of, of heat. And then you talk heat load, right? You integrate under the curve the total heat that you're going to put on the vehicle. They didn't know on Apollo what they were going to have. They didn't really know how they were going to fly it back yet when they were designing it. So the heat rate was uh, bounded by a 20G ballistic return, basically. So you're just screaming through the atmosphere, just poking right through it as, as soon as you can. Heat rate goes up, um, but the heat load's not that bad. For the heat load limiting case, it was a shallow return, barely captured in the atmosphere a very long time, long heat load. Uh, what that ended up, those two conservative cases, is you had a two times over design on the lunar uh, shield, except for the windward torus area right up here, where they learned a little bit about aerodynamics and flow expansion. Because you had that expansion, you got uh, recession in the recession in the uh, in the uh, heat shield itself, and you actually started to hit limits on that area right there. Um, but it was good that they had the uh, the over design. Now for shuttle, you can't design it two times over designed um, because you needed a reusable system that was lightweight. Um, so the thought was that, hey, this is not a capsule. I can control this thing. I can bring it back and fly pretty much any trajectory that I desire. Let's pick our trajectory and then build our heat system, our thermal protection system based on that. So the thought was that the shuttle would stay higher in the atmosphere for a longer period of time, and that would allow it to have laminar flow. You wouldn't be down in the thicker atmosphere where you could trip a boundary layer. Laminar flow is just very smooth flow on the underside of the vehicle. That's opposed to turbulent flow, which is what it sounds like, turbulent where you're getting a lot of mixing and it, and it brings up the heat. Um, so that was the design was that we were going to have laminar flow all the way down to Mach 8, and then we would design the trajectory to, to, uh, to enable that. And uh, that allowed us to minimize our conservatism in the design and that we could fly a normal trajectory, normal material properties in a smooth surface and design to that, uh, to that level. Now, I'll tell you this, that the... Um, uh, when we flew the, the shuttle for the first time uh, in the orbital flight tests, the design did have some conservatism in it in that it was designed for a polar orbit reentry with a maximum cross range. thought was, well, we're going to take it to Edwards. We'll reduce the cross range down to, to almost nothing, and, uh, and that's where our margin in the design will occur. And we'll do that over the first four flights, see how the, uh, the heat shield responds, and then, then make any changes. Now, you can see what, what happened here is that for the lunar side, and I'm sure y'all have already read that while I was talking, but for Apollo orbital return and lunar return, this was the design case. This is the, the heat load and this is the heat rate. This is shuttle. So these were the, this was the design case, and that's what uh, it, was, uh, it was actually predicted to do, and that's exactly what, what we expected to get with that laminar flow. So you can tell the, the important piece of this is you had some margin on the Apollo heat shield. On shuttle, you didn't have very much margin at all. So you were counting on that laminar flow down to, uh, down to Mach 8. And then we looked at STS-1, and this is an actual STS-1 picture here, and this is up by the nose landing gear door is a piece of ice or something came off, made a big gouge in there. The important piece is this. It's uh, called a gap filler. Uh, as the tiles were put together, there'd be small gaps between the tiles, and we'd put this felt material. It's almost like cardboard made of felt. Glue it down in between the tiles. Uh, to, to keep heat from getting down in between there. When you have a damage, that gap filler can stick up. Now, holes where you have gouges in the tile, that's not so bad because they're kind of deadheaded and they don't really trip the boundary layer very much, but something sticking up, like a gap filler, that's giving you turbulent flow above the Mach 8 where you designed to. And uh, there, the problem was that the condition just Back in the early 80s, you didn't have the computer power to do a lot about uh, modeling it very well. Uh, we had very limited instrumentation. We had one half of Columbia was, uh, had instrumentation on it. The other half didn't. Actually, this one on STS-1 gave you a flow that was on the uh, other half, right? So you didn't get the, the data that you wanted. Um, so we had limited instrumentation, uh, not very good modeling of it, and not a very good understanding of what the flight impacts were, but we were violating what well, we designed to. We were not carrying laminar flow all the way down to Mach 8 with, with these kind of damages, and this was a regular occurrence. As a matter of fact, post-Columbia, uh, post 
um, when we really put a focus on modeling this better and understanding it better, uh, we had a gap filler that just kind of vibrated its way out up at the nose of the vehicle, almost where the STS-1 damage was, and we still didn't have the modeling capability uh, to determine if it was going to be an issue or not, so we sent Steve Robinson out on a kind of a crazy EVA, right, where we put him on the arm and stuck him over there, and, uh, and he plucked that gap filler out so that we wouldn't have that, uh, that turbulent flow. So clearly we had, we had not advanced enough in our, in our modeling ability to, uh, to be able to talk about it. Now, after Columbia, obviously, TPS was a huge focus for the program. Um, we had a lot of urgency on it. Um, what we ended up doing is that we ended up inspecting. We built this 60-foot-long boom with two lasers and cameras on it that we could go and scan the reinforced carbon-carbon wings and nose, look at all the tile from the, uh, from the International Space Station, look at all the blankets that were on the top, at the windows. We had 100% inspection on that vehicle. We knew if we had any kind of problems at all with any of the thermal protection system. Outstanding. Knowledge is good, right? Before, we had no idea what was on the, on the bottom of the vehicle. Um, we really improved our modeling capability through ArcJet tests and advanced computer simulation tests, and we developed repair, which when, right after Columbia, a lot of very smart people came to us and said, you'll never do it. You can't do it. The problem is too difficult. Um, you'll have foam squirting all over the place. It'll never work. And uh, we ended up having uh, two different repair capabilities for the reinforced carbon-carbon, a putty and a plate. Uh, and we had three different repair methods for tile. Uh, we didn't need any of them, but it, you can see that, that the, the, the safety greatly improved post-Columbia and that you inspected so you knew what you had. You were able to model it to understand the effects on your flight performance, and you had repair if it wasn't acceptable from that modeling. Now, um, we still had doubters, right? Even though we said we had a repair capability. We actually flew this. This is the box that was in the aft part of the payload bay of, uh, I think it was Endeavor that we did this on, where we sent a crew member, we sent two crew members out on a spacewalk. They opened up the door. They had all these gouges in tiles. They took the hardware that we would use with the material we would use. We squirted it in there. They did all the things they needed to do to make it nice. Uh, and then we closed the door, we f came back, we immediately took it off the vehicle, took it to the ArcJet facility, and put it through an entry. And it did great. It did just outstanding. So we had repair, right? Um, we also said, you know what? We don't think we know the modeling as well as we think we do. We're not sure that we really understand what a gap filler uh, would look like uh, from, a, from a turbulence and, and how much heating it would actually provide. So what did we do? Is we tested is we took a tile and we put a protuberance on it, this little thing sticking up here, and we, we worked our way up, I don't remember what we did, three-eighths of an inch, half an inch, three-quarters of an inch, something like that. We flew it five or six times. But what was important is we put a thermocouple right on the tip of this guy, and downstream we put thermocouples so they'd be in the wake, and then you would have correlated data that would say, okay, if you had a gap filler, if you had something that was disturbing the flow at this Mach number, this is what your resultant heating is going to be. We did the test to understand exactly what it was. Turned out it was a lot less than we thought it was going to be. This, thing, this tile looked great every time we flew it. The thermocouple said, oh, you're way off on your, on your uh, predictions. Uh, it's not as, uh, not as hot as you think it is. The wake testing was, uh, was, uh, was much better than we thought it was, but you didn't know that. So we did the, the work to go find out. Let's see if it'll come up here. I don't think it's going to. Yep. We also sent a... Um, it's such a neat thing, too. Let me, there we go. Look at that. Okay, we sent a P3 out with, uh, with infrared uh, cameras on it that were mounted to go look at the vehicle. And you can see where we have that protuberance is right there. And it's hot, almost as hot as we have up on the RCC and the wing leading edge. And that protuberance is causing that turbulent flow and that increased heating in that area. The other thing we learned that we didn't expect to learn is watch back here and you'll see the jets fire. So you're getting to see the interaction between a reaction control system jets and the, uh, the aerodynamic flow around the vehicle, which was something that we had never been able to model before. Anyone want to see that one again? Yeah, me too. I love this one. So, so we got some additional information that we didn't even expect to get there, right? As we, we got the information on the, um, the turbulence and how that would affect the heating from those, those um, uh, those thermocouples so we could ground our models and really understand it. And then we also got some, uh, some flow field data that we didn't even expect to get. 
The other piece that we did, just because the Orion guys were worried about heating, remember I showed you the, the Apollo capsule, the windward torus, where it got really hot up on that edge? The Orion guys were very aware of that and, and were working it, and they wanted to put a coating on the, on the back side of the vehicle there so that it would not have those kind of problems. We ended up putting that coating on some of those downstream tiles to see how it would work. And we actually we learned some very interesting things about, about how we needed to go design the, uh, the Orion heat shield. So, okay, we had software, we had hardware, great lessons learned, what did we do? We tested like crazy, we continually evolved, we never were satisfied, we, we kept rolling. TPS, what did we do? Designed it, kind of lived with it, right? We, we weren't continually evolving, uh, we weren't continually trying to understand, uh, we were not looking at the flight performance and saying this is what we needed to go do. Um, we didn't evolve to better systems, we didn't have better modeling, we didn't have better imagery, we had no idea what we had on imagery. Repair, we said, was too hard. Um, in, in, what was it? Was it too technically difficult, too expensive? Um, I don't know, but I tell you what, after Columbia, we did it. We showed it could be accomplished. We flew with very high confidence. As program manager, I never worried about the TPS when we re-entered. I had 100% confidence that it was going to be absolutely fine when we re-entered. You could never say that before Columbia, right? We had to do that work. We had to understand, but we didn't do it on the TPS. Okay, and I threw external tank in here because I think this is really interesting. And we're having these debates about hardware architectures, right, and vehicle architectures. This is the, this is the question to you that I will give you as, as program manager. Um, here you are. I showed you all the complicated things that we did, right? You know, just amazingly complicated stuff, right? Uh, never bored, right? Why was it the external tank was the thing that kept me up at nights? Why in the world would that be? I mean, it was the least complex, and it's complex, no doubt, it's complex, but compared to solid rocket boosters and an orbiter and the space shuttle main engines, it is, it is the least complex of all those big hardware elements. We had problems with engine cutoff sensors, and that actually wasn't the sensors, it was connections and wiring. We had problems with the umbilical that would go up to it that scrubbed us several times. We had problems with foam loss. And the answer is that the tests and the verification were different. What's the one piece of the vehicle we didn't get back every single flight? External tank, right? We were able to verify flight performance on the orbiter because we got it back. We were able to verify flight performance on solid rocket boosters and SSMEs because we got them back. You didn't get back the external tank. So did we instrument it more so we could really understand how it was performing? No. It's the least instrumented of any of the pieces at all. Do we go and test it where we filled it up and then maybe take a look at the, at the tank and, and see how it performed? No, we didn't do that until after Columbia. And I'll tell you, when the, the Columbia Accident Investigation Board did their, did their studies, they didn't understand why we lost foam. We didn't understand why we lost foam until we took a tank that we had filled up on the pad. We were having all these ecosensor problems with it. We finally bagged it and we said, we're going to just send it back to Michoud and go rework this. We put it on the barge, sent it back to Michoud, started dissecting, and we understood exactly why we were getting foam loss. When should that test have been performed? Pre-STS-1. Load up your rocket, have discrepant uh, things happening to a piece of it, but you don't investigate it, you don't send it back, you don't understand exactly what's going on. You, you see in the pattern here, right? is you gotta, you're never done. You have to stay hungry. You have to continue to test. You have to continue to improve your understanding of it. If you think that you can design a rocket or a system, if you can design a rocket or a system and, and just walk away from it and continue to fly it forever like, like you got cars rolling off an assembly line, you're wrong. Because things change. Vendors change, materials change. Uh, Jane might have been putting this one thing together and now it's Joe's turn to put it together and, and you're not real sure that they had a really good handoff, right? You gotta continue to test and understand and, and make sure that you know exactly what you're gonna go fly. So, we talked, how diverse are these systems? We talked software, we talked propulsion, we talked a thermal protection system, and then a major component of the vehicle. They all had different histories based on test and verification and that continuous improvement, that need to keep doing things. Um, Post-Columbia, we had a strong program for the TPS. We had strong programs for software and propulsion all throughout. So 
the takeaway that I'd like you to, to, to go from this is that it takes time for a system to mature. Remember all the initial problems with software, all the initial problems with the main engine. We finally got there, though. And it's just because you evolved it and you understood it as you went along and you tested like crazy. Okay, I think I've beaten that one enough. Let me talk about one more thing before I end here today. And it's, it, it follows on to, to what we're going to do next, what we're going to do after shuttle, what we're going to do after ISS. What was the shuttle? The shuttle was not a destination in and of itself. If you remember, I went and talked about all the different things that the shuttle has done over 30 years. Did we imagine that in the late 70s, that we would do all of those things? No way. We thought we would be deploying comm satellites, doing some DOD missions. Maybe someday we'll be able to build a space station. Look at all the other things that the space shuttle did. And that's because it was flexible and it was a capability. It was something that you had built a lot of different options into it so that you could go and fly all those different varied missions. It was a very flexible architecture. ISS is exactly the same way. ISS is a very, now we're into the, into the phase of research and utilization for ISS. And people point to it and say, well, what's the one thing coming from ISS that I, well, we don't know. It is a capability. Shuttle was a capability and it served us extremely well for 30 years. ISS is a capability that's going to serve us well for at least a decade. I think as we're thinking about the next things, what I'd like you to take from this thing is let's think capabilities. Let's think how do we build something that we can use in the future for a variety of missions, many things that we can go do. And whatever we build, if you're in charge of it or if you're working on it, please go test it like crazy. Continually improve it. And I wanted to thank you and share with you my favorite picture. This is the two shuttles that are on the pad getting ready to go serve us Hubble for the last time. And you can see that God was smiling on the shuttle program on that day. Thank you all very much. I think there's some time for some questions if anybody out in the audience has some questions for John. Come on. Covered, you covered all? There's one right there. Yeah, maybe just stand up and, and be as loud as you can. And A couple, yeah. Um, you know, that's interesting because at the very beginning of the shuttle program, we had a different abort strategy. Uh, we had, we uh, didn't have a lot of the capability with COM and things that, uh, that we had towards the end of the program. So we were continually adding a capability to it. Um, but we were limited, at least with the older GPCs, until we improved them. Uh, we maxed out the, the memory of the box, basically. And uh, if you came in with a change that you wanted to, to make to make it a safer system or a more efficient system or more flexible, uh, a lot of times you had to identify what you wanted to cut uh, the flight software. And, uh, and that sounds kind of brutal, but actually it was useful because we didn't end up having much fluff in the software at all. Uh, we were able to, uh, to uh, uh, skinny it down, and if you had a really good safety trade, then you could make it, you would code it, it would, it would go on, but you'd pull something else out that maybe you didn't think was quite as important. Do you have any? No, yeah. So what's the size of the box? Oh, yeah, yeah, that was the real question you asked, wasn't it? Yeah, I don't know. I'll have to, I'll have to get it for you. It, it's pretty small compared to, it, it's very small compared to what you would think of. It's less than a 386 computer kind of size. And, and as John said, we had to really pack a lot of software in there. A lot of it was written in assembly language because we couldn't actually host it in a, a more higher order language. So it, it was a, a big challenge for the teams to figure out a way to, to get all that software in the system. And, and we can get you the numbers offline, the exact size of it. So. It's another skill that will die with me, I guess, is being able to read shuttle assembly code. Oh, well. <laughs> I know that if anybody needs to. OK. And the language is how. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, I have the microphone. I'm back here. OK. <laughs> My <qu> <laughs> wow. Um, so you had shown uh, graphs for the software and the hardware of the rate of error, and you showed that over time they uh, 
sort of the rate of error didn't increase anymore. And for the software, that was pretty clear. But for the hardware, even after a 30 plus year period, it didn't quite reach that stage. I was wondering what uh, NASA plans to do differently with the heavy transport system so that they can uh, reach that stage quicker. Well, you know, the design that, uh, that just came out uh, for the space launch system used a lot of heritage hardware from the, uh, from the space shuttle. So we'll be able to take the lessons that were learned on that space shuttle main engine and roll them into the, uh, into the next program. So we're kind of short-circuiting that infant mortality and that, that initial development piece of it. Um, you're never going to get to zero on hardware because it's milk, remember? Um, and, and you're going to end up having, having issues. Um, but, you know, if you can get past that initial startup. The other thing I would say, you know, be patient with new designs and new things. The new commercial companies that are coming out, uh, the new designs that NASA is doing, they're going to have issues as we go along. One, as you can see with the shuttle program, we had a lot of issues, and, and it takes time to work through those and have a mature, reliable system. Um, that doesn't change, and there's no, there's no solution other than to just go through the testing, do the engineering, understand it, and, and then improve the system over time as, as you can. Uh, back here? Do we got another one back here? Okay. Uh, I have a quick one. They have the uh, mic. You need to uh, What were the lessons learned on the SRBs? You know, the solid rocket boosters, uh, of course, we had the Challenger accident. Uh, due to a field joint problem where we had leakage uh, as the case expanded and, and you got a, uh, uh, a blow by and it just it happened to be blown right on the external tank. Um, that entire system was redesigned and uh, they did some very clever things in those field joints such that the, um, the pressure of that case would actually seal the joint up tighter. It's called a, a J-leg seal in there and uh, it's very clever. And after that happened, you know, we would tear down the, the uh, solid rocket boosters every single, uh, every single time after the flight and look specifically at field joints. And uh, we never had an issue with those uh, after that. Um, you know, so much so that, that some of the discussion right now is, hey, do we let them just go plunk in the water and not go get them and look at them, which I have my own thoughts on, but we'll, we'll let that discussion be going on. But that problem, just like the, uh, the TPS piece, was solved. Yeah. The other thing I would add is we did developmental tests on the solid rocket motors where we would actually go in and cut one of the O-rings and then actually see how the motor performed with a, with a failure in it. If we get new materials we're bringing online, new rubbers, new uh, insulation material, we'd actually test them in a developmental motor off, offline. And, and again, prior to Challenger, we, did, we, we thought we were smart enough we didn't need to keep doing that developmental testing, so we had cut that out of the program. And then after Challenger, we added it back in. So it's exactly to John's point is you, you got to stay hungry. You got to keep looking for problems, even though they're not showing up. And a good way to do that is developmental tests and, and continue to keep looking. You all got that right. We cut the O-rings on the ground test <laughs> articles, right? Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, is, is there any uh, strategy to conserve the knowledge about this complex uh, system? Because I think... Um, Maybe in 10 years or so, all the people are gone and the knowledge is lost otherwise. Uh, you're right. And there was, um, I'm going to be really brutally honest on this one, okay. The, uh, we spent a lot of time doing knowledge capture uh, and making sure that we, uh, we captured as much of the corporate knowledge that was out in the contractors, that was out in the, in the shuttle workforce as we possibly could. How many people have contributed to a knowledge capture? How many people have actually read one? You know, so uh, the number should decrease, right? And and I think it does. And it's very hard unless you live it, unless you're doing the tests, unless you're you're um, you're a part of the uh, the flying program uh, that is responsible for it to actually learn those lessons and, and understand it. This stuff is really dear to my heart, right? But you guys, eh, maybe you'll you'll think about it a little bit on the drive home, right? Um, the the way to keep that knowledge in there is to keep the people around that actually did it. And I think that's why it was so important to have. The, sp the uh, space launch system uh, laid out for us that we're going to use a lot of the hardware that we had uh, we had developed and used for the space shuttle because we can keep some of those people around that have already learned those difficult lessons. Yes, sir. John, I've got a question about your new gig. Um, so the 
statistics you showed over a long period of time are priceless, and I presume we are generating similar graphs from station now. So the question is, isn't it possible to derive a factor for programs that are in formulation that's kind of a ratio between ambition and experienced reality um, so that we can programmatically build headroom into our assumptions for a change? That's really good. Uh, yeah. We, yes, we should do that. I, but, you know, but but what do you get to, right? Is is you get to a, you have desires, right? And and this is what you'd like to go do, and then you get your budget, right? So then you cut out all the testing, right? And then you think, all right, I'm I'm ready to go, right? I can, right? It takes a lot of discipline, and it takes people that have that have been there that have seen that OPF chart that you saw originally, and then the the reality one that actually know that that's what it takes to go fly in space. Um, it takes a lot of discipline to understand that and to, and to say that this has to be a part of my, this has to be a part of the equation before I ever get into it, that, that that's what it's going to take to actually go fly. The pretty PowerPoint charts are not, they won't happen, okay? They won't. And, and I, you know, I, I've spent the last, it's really nice to come and talk about the shuttle. Thank you all very much for letting me do this because uh, the last five weeks I think I've been looking at design reference missions on what do we do, you know, later on. And, uh, and I've got some ideas, but I'm very colored by that, by the, the OPF picture, the, the proposed and the, and the reality. And so, you know, when people come in and say, we can do this and this and this and this, and it'll be really easy and really fast and really, you know, it, then you think, okay, no, that is not how reality is going to be. Let's do what we know we can do. Let's push our technology uh, in the areas that we need to. Let's use what we know how to go do already, uh, and let's have an achievable program that's sustainable, right? Not some pie in the sky thing that you know a couple of years down the road we're double over our budget and the schedule's you know way out there. And so I I hope that that uh, we can take some of the folks that came off of shuttle, some of the experienced folks that came out of uh, of ISS, some of the constellation folks that went through all this testing that they've been going through, and we can have a more realistic plan moving forward. At least that's my that's my goal. Frank. I'd like to ask both of you this. What, what is NASA doing to apply these lessons in the commercial arena, the commercial crew arena in particular, where um, the operators are going to be staying hungry for profits as well as for, for safety? Um, just from what I have seen, I think that's a little unfair. Um, I love the fact that, that SpaceX, for example, is testing um, at McGregor daily. They are, they are doing propulsion testing like you ought to do propulsion testing. Is they're out there tweaking their engines and, and in the corner of the box, and, and I think you can see that in the propulsion successes that they've had. Um, they test, 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 test. They've got a very hungry uh, attitude uh, in that uh, they want to, uh, they want to, to uh, have problems that they can go correct to make the system more robust. Uh, orbital, same kind of thing. They just uh, tested an AJ-26 out at, uh, out at Stennis uh, this week. Uh, they're going to continue to test as well. Um, Sierra Nevada's not quite far enough along to go do that. Um, some of the other guys, you know, Bigelow has put up two of the subscale uh, inflatables to test and understand. So I, I think they're doing that. I think they're, they understand. I feel very comfortable. I'm very saddened, but I feel very comfortable. I've lost three of my most senior shuttle uh, people that were in the program that I would trust doing anything to commercial companies. Um, that's one good thing you're going to get out of this, is you're going to take people that actually learned how to do it on the shuttle, learned how to get hardware into space. Now, you, some of you all might not have liked it because it was, it was too expensive or, or not reliable enough or, or whatever, but these people got hardware in space, very complicated hardware in, into space. Now they've seeded out, and they're working for these commercial companies, and they take that attitude with them. And, uh, and I think that's going to be to the benefit of, uh, of uh, all of the, uh, the commercial companies. Did I answer, Frank? Did you want to yeah. Hi. My name is Satya Silva. I'm former shuttle flight control. Thank and you. <laughs> anytime. Um, I was just wondering, with regards to, um, I heard we had two GPC failures in the last flight, 
And I was wondering if you could speak to what happened and how we could go 20 years without any computer failures and then get two on the last flight. Were you in uh, Houston or in, uh, in uh, Florida? I was working in Houston, but I actually left um, last year to do my... The people in charge of the computers are the, the DPS, yeah. the, the data processing uh, system section. We hang a plaque at the end of every, uh, of every mission, the most worthy flight controller, and we just thought the DPS flight controllers were trying to hang the plaque for the very last mission, right? So we had two, <laughs> two very strange. Uh, do you recall what we had? Oh, I remember. It was a single event upset. Yeah. It was one of those things. You know, the galactic cosmic radiation hit the box, and, and there are parts of the, um, of the uh, computer that are not rad hard. They are, and that's the registers as you go through. You can't rad hard the, rad harden those. Uh, and if you get a hit in that register and then you get a miscompare, then the, then the GPC fails. That was one of them, and the other one? I think it was the same. I don't remember. I don't remember. But that was, that was one of them. So it was one of those things that, that happens, right? But uh, the, the crew did an initial program load on it. It came back and worked uh, just fine. Anyway, there was a debate. Do we put it in this four computer set for reentry or not? We did, and it worked absolutely fine. Yeah. And again, I think the credit to the software team was that they were able to go right. do a data dump of this software and, and confirm that it was a single event upset. They isolated the specific memory that was d damaged, and they knew that the only way that particular piece of memory could get uh, corrupted was by a single event upset. So it's, again, a tribute to all this testing that had gone before that in a very, very short amount of time, probably in eight hours, they could actually understand exactly what occurred in that computer and say, yep, it's good enough to go ahead, re-IPL, and bring it back online. So. Again, it, it's, it echoes exactly what John's points were. Yeah, the other thing, if you're in, so the, we were reducing our budget, right? We ended up flying the end of the program at about a billion and a half a year, right? Because we weren't producing a lot of stuff. Two areas that I would not cut was flight software and systems integration. And um, you may run into that in any program that you run into as you're kind of clicking along that they want to take systems integration. We, we kept doing the same thing, right? As we would, we would, have a problem, we, systems integration would be up very high in uh, systems engineering integration, and then it would slowly taper off, and then you'd have a problem, and it would go right back up, right? And so why? <laughs> that is a cause and effect relationship there, is as you take uh, systems engineering and integration people off of a program, I think this is a Shannon observation. I don't have a neat chart like I have, but I think that your potential for having an issue uh, that crosses between different elements really goes up quite a bit. I think we're going to ask one more question and call it an evening. I'm having fun. Any more? Okay, one over here. You can yell if you want. I, I bet you got it in you. What are the strategy followed for dealing uh, dealing with aging of hardware? Did you have like a fixed uh, age for all the various hardware components and you replace them, or did you? Just replace the ones which needed replacement, depending on what you found in the testing. Yeah, that was. Uh, okay. I'm going to answer for a little while here on this one. Okay. Um, well, I like this, right? You know, is is we had a very specific program uh, in the shuttle uh, called orbiter maintenance down periods, where periodically we'd take the vehicle down, really take it apart, and and inspect different uh, different pieces of it. That would inform us as to different areas that we needed to pay attention to structurally. Um, or wiring or all the different uh, different hardware pieces. Um, if we ended up having a problem on a vehicle with a specific piece of hardware, we'd immediately go to the other vehicles and check out the same uh, kind of hardware. So we had we had that kind of uh, early uh, early indicator thing that would would point us towards uh, towards different hardware. Um, the other thing we we would end up doing a lot of times is is we would uh, end up looking at, uh, at hardware lifetimes and looking for things. We spent a lot of money and a lot of time looking for uh, early indicators, uh, the, the precursor uh, information that would tell us if something was, uh, was not working quite right. Um, people that, that uh, think we could go just fly shuttle, um, you know, in, if I had a tank, okay, if we started tank production, go fly shuttle again, that's not really true. In the last uh, really two to three years of the shuttle program, um, we had hardware that was aging that if we were going to continue flying for another 10 years, we would have replaced. Um, but we didn't do that. We ended up taking the, the, the least old piece of hardware, installing it, and then uh, and, and we would do tests to make sure we were okay. But we were only okay for a limited period of time. Really some things that needed some designs. 
uh, some power control assemblies that were, were getting old. We used operational workarounds, things like that. Um, I would say that if we tried to restart the shuttle line, we would probably end up spending at least a couple of years redesigning some hardware uh, that we, we normally would have, but we were coming up to the end of the program, not have those operational workarounds. Did anyone else? Well, they were just dying. I tell you what, you can catch me after this. I'll just be lurking about the, uh, the lobby. But uh, thank you all for your time very much. I, I really appreciate it.